This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. of the United States. Donald Trump has made his first speech as president to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. What did President Trump's speech bring to light? All the nations of the world, friend or foe, will find that America is strong, America is proud, and America is free. Much of what Trump said was about domestic politics. But what will U.S. foreign policy look like? 45 years after China signed the Shanghai Communique with the U.S., how will bilateral ties develop under Trump? The U.S. president's primary concerns seem to be deal-making and personal relationships. How will this approach influence further developments for U.S. and other alliances in the Asia-Pacific region? Donald Trump has made his first speech as president to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. In it, he touched on a range of issues, emphasizing the desire to correct past mistakes, but offering little detail about how he will go about correcting those mistakes. To discuss the underlying issues, both international and domestic, brought to light by President Trump's speech, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Tao Wen Zhao, senior research fellow of the Institute of American Studies of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Donald Trump put all he said during the campaign together in his address to the Congress. And it sounds like another campaign speech. And Rick Dunham, a visiting scholar at Tsinghua University. In his speech, Donald Trump uh, gave, uh, offered at the world a more moderate tone. The big question is, when it comes to policy, what are going to be the specifics? Isn't it a very serious attempt at a reconciliation across the aisle in the D.C.? That's our topic. This is a Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. I was watching uh, part of the uh, televised uh, speech by President Trump, the best, allegedly, by this uh, president. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think are the most interesting parts? Oh, well, actually, uh, Donald Trump touched a lot of uh, points both domestic, international, and uh, all he said during the campaign, almost he repeated all of uh, those major points. But uh, uh, one thing actually, you know, I think a little bit new, uh, that is uh, he is going to increase the defense budget by 10 percent, 54 billion U.S. dollars. He said that uh, President Obama and the Obama administration, our military uh, was weakened, yeah. But, but he said he is going to rebuild U.S. military. But now he's going to increase the defense budget and to put his uh, idea into practice. Well, we are perhaps uh, mesmerized by his vow to increase military spending. At the same time, he also said in his speech that uh, he urges the Congress to approve one trillion U.S. dollars in the investment of infrastructure, creating millions of jobs. That's also pretty impressive. This is one of the pillars uh, that he hopes uh, would support and sustain the U.S. economy. Well, having covered the White House for Business Week for 15 years, I know a lot about economic policy and budget debates. It's a math question. Donald Trump is going to spend a record amount on defense. He's going to add trillions of dollars in spending for inter infrastructure. And he's going to offer tax cuts, huge tax cuts. The numbers don't add up. I, it may be good for the economy. Yes, infrastructure spending will be good for the economy. Even spending more on defense will create some additional jobs. But in the long term, this is going to add trillions of dollars to the national debt. There is no, no two ways about it if he follows through these promises. And many who watched the program said uh, uh, he's uh, still on the campaign trail. It's yet another campaign speech. Do you think he's more like a protectionist? Well, uh, I would not use that word. Because he says uh, yeah. his job is to represent the interests of the Americans and the American 
uh, uh, continents instead of representing the world. Generally speaking, he representing the United States of America. It's correct. And he, he said so in sharp contrast with the what President Xi Jinping yeah. said at the Davos. <laughs> but uh, he said uh, I'm. He's not. He's not representing the, the world. That's correct. He does not represent the world. Does that but indicate a retreat yeah. from uh, American world leadership? Does it indicate he, the early no. signs of uh, uh, isolationism? This time, this time, he said the U.S. will lead the world. Right. He has never said that during the campaign. By prioritizing American time, national interests, yes. he hopes uh, he could lead the world for yet another century. Well, I think I think <laughs> there's a contradiction here, yeah. but. If you, if you understand the Trump thinking, there's a logic to it. He thinks America should be great again, meaning America should tell the world what to do, not be part of a multilateral uh, decision-making process. But at the same time, he says we should take care of America first, which means trade protectionism. He says he's not a protectionist. He's in favor of fair trade, uh, free trade defined as fair trade. Within the Trump psyche, it all makes sense. but. Uh, we, if we are now analyzing it from a traditional standpoint, there's an internal contradiction that he wants America first, he wants to be somewhat of an isolationist, but he's also very much that the United States should tell the rest of the world how it should be ordered. And he rejected the job-killing TPP. Right. That has caused an uproar among Democrats. What do you think of uh, the absence of American leadership whilst China at the same time allegedly will take over the leadership? And that's, of course, the top concern of Japanese. Uh, well, uh, I don't think China will take the leadership, whether in the world. Are you or saying in that Asia we are not ready yet? Uh, we are not ready yet, and uh, we are not capable yet. And uh, China's concern, in primary, certainly, uh, it's on domestic affairs, uh, where, uh, as uh, Xi Jinping recently said, we are still uh, at the initial stage of the socialism. But and that stage is going to last for I, mean, I, I mean, I disagree with that a little bit in that I think that, yes, China will not be the most powerful economic voice in the world, but I think with the United States retreating from multilateral trade agreements, that China and Germany will stake out a bigger and bigger position as the leaders of the world in terms of negotiating trade deals. I mean, there's a difference between being the leading economic power in the world and being the leading spokesperson for multilateral trade. And I think we're already seeing some of that with President Xi Jinping in Davos. And I, and, and I think that depending on what happens in the French and German elections, you're going to have willing trade partners at the top of the EU uh, to push more for multilateral trade, whether the U.S. is part of that or not. Well, do you and both agree that he has set the tone for the next four years of his presidency, for example, by addressing the issue of immigration? And he praised Canada, which adopts a merit-based immigration policy. Yes, he set a tone for the next four years. Uh, but uh, with regard to TPP you just mentioned, not just the Democrats do not agree with the U.S. withdrawing from TPP, but also a lot of the Republicans do not agree. You know, uh, last September, uh, it was during the campaign, John McCain delivered a speech at the Heritage Foundation. And he uh, specifically emphasized that U.S., uh, it is a, a conservative tradition to support free trade. And he quoted one Singaporean leader, yeah, allegedly it's Lee Kuan, uh, Li Xianlong. Yeah, if U.S. cancels the TPP, you are finished in Asia. He quoted the, uh, Li Xianlong's word. But so a lot of uh, Republicans do not agree U.S. withdrawing from TPP. Rick, the defiance of uh, President Trump in canceling and rejecting TPP has really left me bewildered and wondering aloud why he called TPP killing American jobs. Well, at first during the campaign, if you remember, he was confused and there was a Republican presidential debate and he said that the TPP was designed to benefit uh, China. He didn't realize that China was not part at that time. Now he understands that China is not part of it. Don't you think this it. is a very but, big, serious joke? But, his, but, but, but now, now, it, now he does understand. And he, he, but he believes that this would open the door to more jobs going to Korea more jobs going to Vietnam, more jobs going to the Asia-Pacific region, if not necessarily Japan. Uh, and so 
that's, that's, what he, that's what he means. He says that the United States in multilateral and bilateral trade, jo trade pacts is giving away too much, is giving away American jobs in exchange for big American corporations getting access. It's not helping American workers, his argument is. It's helping multinational corporations. Uh, president Trump is not the first American president who called for fair trade instead of 100% free trade. Let me go back to uh, the presidency of uh, Ronald Reagan, who also mm -hmm. stood for fair trade. And therefore, are there any differences, I'm wondering, if any, between the advocacy of Ronald Reagan and what uh, President Trump says this time around? And not just uh, those Republican presidents. Uh, under uh, President Clinton, the U.S. also advocated for fair and managed trade you know, right. with, with Japan because Japan has been a strong competitor for the United States for a long, long time, since the 1980s. Um, but one thing is important, you know, Donald Trump always thinks that United States is a victim of globalization. Uh, he, he thinks that China, uh, India, and other uh, emerging economies got benefited from globalization. But the United States lost a lot of jobs, five million jobs, or even more than that. And he said that during the past eight years, 60,000 factories went to China. <laughs> so the United States lost a lot of jobs. So he does not like multilateral uh, Rick, you've stayed agreement. in this host country of China for uh, quite a few months. Uh, your perspective now, do you think China's uh, manufacturing industry has led to the loss of uh, thousands of American factories? The answer is that that's a very complex question. Ch some Chinese manufacturing has resulted in loss of American jobs in certain industries. I don't think things like steel Things, things like coal have anything to do with uh, the loss of American jobs. Uh, but at the same time, trade with China has cost some manufacturing jobs in some parts of the United States, but it's resulted in many, many more jobs that are created because of the two-way trade, because of the uh, increased business from the Chinese companies in America and American companies in China. The problem when you analyze trade as a pie with winner and loser is you're just thinking about which American jobs were lost, whereas there are always wins and losses. And China has had the same thing because wages have increased in China because of the new manufacturing uh, jobs, because the standard of living has gone up. And in some ways, China becomes less competitive, and there are some jobs leaving China manufacturing for lower cost countries. Again, it's a complex issue. It's always easy to say it in a sound bite. It's hard <laughs> yes, to indeed, explain are, it in a we debate. We are a catch-up economy. Labor costs, commodity prices are all going yeah. up very quickly. But uh, when President Trump says in his speech that uh, uh, people should buy American, hire American, and the pipes should be made of a U.S.-made steel, mm -hmm. what did he mean? Well, uh, in, in this case, he really does, uh, doesn't want to protect American jobs. But actually, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, as uh, Dick said, it's a very complicated thing. For instance, President Obama also launched some uh, anti-dumping, anti-subsidy cases. And uh, we were victims of anti-dumping and anti-subsidy uh, anti yes. uh, investigations. Yes, one case is anti-Chinese imported uh, tires. And, and Obama even said, you know, we uh, preserved 1,100 jobs. But for that, you know, U.S. consumers spend a lot of more money. So one job actually uh, costs uh, 900, more than 900,000 U.S. dollars in the United States. And what do you think of his rejection of Obamacare? Well, he rejects Obamacare at a time when more people in America say they favor it than ever before, even when it was passed. It's easy to say you're against it. There are a lot of problems with Obamacare. There have been from the beginning, because it was a political uh, plan more than a, a coherent health plan. But there's no answer yet. What right. are you going my, to do? My, there's my no question, solution that's been presented. My question is whether he has any alternative truth, alternative story in the post-Obama era. But you are watching Dialogue with uh, Professor Tao Wenzhou and Mr. Rick Dunham. We are discussing the first ever presidential speech uh, by Donald Trump in the joint session of the U.S. Congress. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stay with us, please.
CGTN shows you more, providing a fresh global voice you can trust. And a different look at the world you won't find anywhere else. We offer unparalleled coverage of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We present diverse perspectives on news and newsmakers from around the world. We want to engage our viewers with stories that represent the complete picture. We want to share with you ideas that matter to us all. The stories, the people, the issues. A new and balanced perspective. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back. China was bashed ruthlessly on the campaign trail, but I was surprised a little bit this time when I was watching his speech in the Congress that this seldom was China mentioned. And yet everybody understands once. clearly that, oh, yes, once of course, but that's not a big deal. But everybody understands that uh, the U.S.-China relationship is smacks of geopolitical rivalry, and we were bashed, we were singled and a scapegoat for outsourcing American jobs, blah, 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 or manipulating the currency. What do you think of uh, the importance of uh, or the nature of China in his uh, foreign policy? Well, uh, sino american relations is one of the most important bilateral relations in the world, or even the most important bilateral relations in the world. Uh, President Obama, Hillary Clinton said that many, many times, and there was a challenge. Question is whether President yes. Donald Trump will accept the new type of major power, major power relationship. Well, uh, well, actually, you know, uh, if you, if you, if you watch the. Uh, uh, Mr. Yang Jiechi's visit to the, to the United States and uh, his meeting with the President Donald Trump. Yeah, he still repeats that no conflict, no confrontation, and uh, mutual respect and win win cooperation. These three are actually the substance of the new type of the great power relationship. I'm not surprised about the substance of what he says. I am surprised about the presence of his son in law. Uh, Jared uh, Fushina, as well as Bannon, the most influential strategic uh, advisor to Donald Trump. Now, many in China try to figure out what the presence of these two heavyweight uh, figures uh, actually means uh, for President Trump and his China policy. Well, I think the two of them are the opposite sides of the Trump psyche on China. Uh, you have Bannon, who has predicted war with China over the South China Sea, and you have Jared Kushner, who is much more cerebral, who is much more into making peace than war, whether it's in the Middle East or in East Asia. Uh, I mean, he's very smart, but he is completely new to diplomacy. And so we don't know what the influence will be. Bannon has a lot of influence over the intellect of Donald Trump, but Jared Kushner is his relative, and he has a lot of emotional impact on Trump. So I think that they will keep it I, that, that Kushner himself will moderate Trump's uh, worst instincts, most hawkish instincts, but Bannon is always there. You know, as, gentlemen, as the bad our, guy. Program, you know our program is getting more entertain, uh, entertaining and palatable because uh, we're talking about presidency of the United States. Now, mm -hmm. you spoke of the intellect of uh, Donald Trump, mm -hmm. the businessman, uh, right. but what about the intellect of uh, Donald Trump, the politician? Uh, how do you rate his presidency? Well, uh, Donald Trump said he is not a politician. He is not going to become a politician. He said that <laughs> during the campaign. But uh, and it seemed to me he is not a po really a politician. And he is not a host yet. He is a still a rebel. Rebel against tradition. Rebel against uh, President Obama's legacy. Rebel against Republican tradition. Yeah, so even today, in the White House. So he's a he's maverick, a and he's maverick. a boy in the China shop. What I mean, do you think I mean, of the impact? I think he's a student still of the presidency who hasn't figured out what his voice will, will be. Will he be a good student? 
Uh, so far, he's had a few Fs, but he was the more presidential. But this, but this is what. Well, that's the point. This is one because he was reading the transcript. He was reading the teleprompter. The tone. Well, he, was, he was accusing President Obama of reading the teleprompter. Exa this time he well, that, was no well, exception. Well, you, you're thinking the old way that you're supposed to be <laughs> consistent. Don, what, it's what Donald Trump is doing now. It's not what he said a year ago or three years ago. But I mean, the key is: will he learn from his mistakes? He hasn't admitted that he made mistakes, but. Republicans will tell you he made dozens of mistakes his first several weeks. The question is, is this the first step toward being a president who reaches out to Congress, the pre a president who doesn't attack uh, the, the press? You know, we are talking, whenever we make comments on presidency of uh, Donald Trump, we, you know, I, I'm wondering a lot whether we are politically correct, because we are the so-called elites. And mm -hmm. he's picked a fight and a war against not only the establishment, but most of the elites in the United States and perhaps in right. the rest of the world. So part of the uncertainty that characterizes the presidency of Donald Trump is whether we are making politically correct comments on this man who has seriously been underestimated on the campaign trail and perhaps during his presidency. Are you confident that we are talking about the right thing smartly? Well, uh, this is, I think, a very important and very serious question. You know, in, in China too, there are different opinions about uh, Donald Trump's personality, but uh, most elites, most elites would agree that Donald Trump is still a, a rebel, and uh, he's against all the establishments, and uh, he's uh, going to uh, uh, represent not just American people, but represent American populism. Yeah. Populism is the word. He is said to be the boy that stripped the emperor of his new clothes. Do you agree? I agree that he's going to be a rebel. I agree he's going to continue to, 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 uh, to, to talk about elites, whether they are American or global. I think if we want to analyze him, if we want to judge him, it has to be by the policy. He can talk all he wants about China and currency manipulation. The question is, what does he do? What we've seen so far is, he pulled back on the rhetoric about Taiwan, and he has uh, stated that he believes in the one China policy. His Secretary of State has talked very diplomatically about the South China Sea, even though during the campaign, Donald Trump and his press secretary were, I mean, were both very hawkish on that issue. Perhaps, Rick and uh, Professor Tao, you both uh, have to spend all yeah. time learning and trying to figure out what the yeah. way of thinking of mm -hmm. a businessman is yeah. like. Because uh, he took the one China principle as a part of the bargaining chip. So he moved forward two steps and step back one step. I mean, move one step yeah. back so that he could milk China. He could uh, maximize the profits of the businessman, the uh, stakeholder in the negotiation as a businessman. Except for so that. So his way yeah. of thinking, his way of negotiating uh, is more interesting, perhaps. Well, he knows. We should take him more seriously. I mean, sometimes. The thing about Donald Trump as a businessman is he knows when to be tough, he knows when to fold, and he knows when he can get a deal. I think with China, he saw China was not going to budge, and he was trying to negotiate like a businessman, put Taiwan on the table so that you can get something else. He quickly realized it wasn't going to work, and he modulated. He's going to pick another fight. He's not, and, and I think as a businessman, it's not just the cut a deal, but it's he knows when to plea bargain. He knows when to cut his losses and move on to something else. Well, well I think I, we should give some credit to President Trump. You know, in the past months, uh, after he took office, he is uh, he has been uh, prudent. He has been uh, very cautious with China. Is that he because said, yeah. we exercised the caution in yeah, the first we, place? Yes, for, for one reason, we exercised we caution. To be Secondly, provoked. he realizes the importance of Sino American relations. And he realizes, as Dick just suggested, if he launches a trade war on China, China would retaliate. And the U.S. would not necessarily win that trade war. And you know, uh, just a few days ago at the last press conference of uh, Mr. Gao Hucheng, who just retired from Cons Commerce Minister, uh, the message is very clear. Of course, we do not want to uh, trade war with the United States. We want a, a successful transition. But if Donald Trump launches a trade war, OK, we are ready. We are ready to retaliate. So the, the message is very clear. 
Today's China is not China 1990s. In 1990s, we really wanted the MFN with the United States. If you know, pres uh, President Clinton really canceled MFN to China, then China would suffer greatly. But today, today's China is not China in 1990s. So, so we are not afraid of a trade war. So Donald Trump must realize that. So he is cautious, although he said so much during the campaign about China, but he actually didn't do anything, and he said a little about China. When we look at the possibility of having a trade war with the United States, uh, do you think, uh, um, particularly the success of uh, Mr. Yang Jiechi's official visit to the White House, and prior to that, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with the American counterpart in the Munich Security Conference, uh, and of course uh, Ivanka visited the Chinese embassy. Now, if you look at the series of diplomatic measures, uh, governmental or non-governmental, uh, perhaps we have underestimated the diplomacy of uh, China, and we have underestimated the overlapping and the common interests or stakes uh, between the United States and China. We have underestimated the uh, flexibility of this executive, business executive. I mean, we have underestimated perhaps uh, his readiness to make a compromise instead of viewing him as a tough guy? Well, I think I'd start with uh, Donald Trump, businessman, respects strength. He respects strong people, yeah. uh, and I think he, he saw some of that in his early dealings with China. Secondly, he doesn't like people to criticize him, to attack him. Everything that China did to push back was done diplomatically, quietly, did not embarrass him. <laughs> So I think that those are the right kind of moves, the right way to deal with someone like Donald Trump. He's still unpredictable, uh, but there have been no mistakes so far in dealing with him. But that. I'm afraid there's a high degree of predictability concerning the deployment of THAAD in the Korean Peninsula, yeah. despite <laughs> our unofficial threat to punish uh, uh, Lotet, the uh, South Korean company, who has over 100 uh, uh, shops and outlets in, in mainland China. Uh, wh what do you think of uh, the uh, first flashpoint, uh, allegedly, between the United States and China geopolitically uh, in Northeast Asia? Well, it's uh, very hard to say, but I agree with you. You know, last September, I visited Washington, D.C. I visited more than 10 think tanks, both the Republicans and Democrats. But people all agree that the Korean Peninsula is more, the most dangerous place in this region. You know, we can what does that mean? Does it mean a yeah, war? Well, yeah, no, that means if the United States and China has a willingness to control, then we can control Taiwan. We can control South China Sea. We can control the Diaoyu Islands. But Korean Peninsula, you just cannot control. You even do not know what happens tomorrow. So that is the most dangerous place. Do you share this uncertainty and unpredictability about the Kim, the young leader in the DPRK? I, I do. I, I believe that he's unpredictable both for China and for the United States. I think tension over Thad is inevitable because I agree with you, Donald Trump is going to move forward with it. The only question is whether the Americans and the Chinese behind the scenes can agree on a united strategy of how to deal with the Kim regime. That, that's eluded us so far, but Donald Trump has the ability to start anew where, where Obama was in a corner at the end. Professor Tao, a lot even in China point out, look, which poses the biggest threat? The nuclear arsenal of DPRK or the THAAD deployment? Of course, it's the nuclear arsenal from an unpredictable uh, hermit-like kingdom of the DPRK, according to Western reports. I think these two things are connected. Yeah, uh, both the nuclear weapons by DPRK But we only target the THAAD and missile the shield side. program. Oh. It, it seems that we have ignored the nuclear threat no. from the DPRK. China has never, no, never ignored the, the DPRK's and nuclear That's the speculation. Asthma. Our yeah. re reluctance, quote unquote, to punish seriously the DPRK has fueled the speculation that we are, after all, the closest ally, the only ally of the DPRK in the post coup For instance, era. just recently, China, for implementing the United Nations resolution, we completely cut the coal import from North Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a widely reported. That's a sort of a, 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 a economic embargo with real teeth. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Well, in this case, North Korea accused China of being a lackey of the United States. It was r its rhetoric <laughs> that you just haven't heard before. If anything, I think it, it is an incentive for 
President Trump and President Xi Jinping to try to have some sort of concerted action, to try to think of a constructive way to try to deal yes, with Yes, indeed. It. It's perhaps a high time for the two countries, the United States and China, to work together and nip it in the bud in the Korean Peninsula. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Global Television Network.